Thank you, and thank you for that kind and generous introduction. It is a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to be here and to contribute uh, to this program. Um, those of you who were here at a previous meeting and heard a similar talk will have some deja vu all over again. And while some of the slides will be quite the same, there's more information, more support, and I hope a bit more clarity about how, in practice, you can use this for yourselves and for your staff. We're looking today at an old friend. The old friend is ascorbate, vitamin C. We're going to look at its use to effectively remove toxic minerals. And we'll also look at a subsidiary question. Is ascorbate an antioxidant or a prooxidant in clinical practice in contrast and comparison to the test tube? It is different in the test tube than it is in the body. And for any of you who have schedules or want to do something else for the rest of the hour, the takeaway is that ascorbate can, when used properly, effectively remove toxic minerals. You can quantify how many micrograms of toxic mineral per gram of ascorbate can be mobilized and excreted when, but only when, sufficient ascorbate is present. Now, sufficient ascorbate is the amount needed to meet the oxidative stress needs of the cell without allowing free radical oxidative damage. It also means to have sufficient antioxidants that you have a very efficient flow of electrons from the membrane into the mitochondria to produce energy and to detoxify. So the reason that ascorbate has the widest range of physiologic amounts is because it has the widest range of half-life. We'll get into those details. Um, I uh, do want to remind myself to mention that I'm an equity holder in both Eliza Act Biotechnologies and Perk. Health Studies Collegium is the foundation that does much of our work. And as you can see by my fellow status, I'm easily bored. <laughs> so our learning objectives today are to understand how to mobilize and safely excrete toxic minerals and their interactions and functions. <clears throat> and then is ascorbate an antioxidant or a prooxidant in practice? Ascorbate is uniquely able, this is an anticipatory slide, but ascorbate is uniquely able to complex, mobilize, and safely excrete toxic minerals. It can be used with other biological detoxification strategies, especially sulfur-rich foods, which we'll talk about. And it can be used with or without pulse D-penicillamine, uh, 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 largely a subject for another time, but penicillamine is one of the chelators that can be used as a pulse agent to enhance and build upon biological detoxification. It's my impression that our outcome results uh, being favorable is largely a fact that we spend a good deal of time on the biological rebalancing and then add to that whatever other therapies are needed. So what about ascorbate? <clears throat> ascorbate is buffered vitamin C. That's the way it's found in food and we only use the forms found in food. That's why we use ascorbate. We use the bioidentical forms which means that you have vicinal hydroxyls. Two hydroxyls on the same side of adjacent carbons. That is unique in biology. Only ascorbate has that. L-ascorbate is the one with the vicinal hydroxyls. The D-ascorbate, the unnatural form, the form we don't recommend, uh, does not have the hydroxyls on the same side of the double bond. It is this molecular structure, uh, the strain on that chemical bond that lowers the beneficial oxidation reduction potential and allows ascorbate to pick up the toxic metals among other intoxicants and remove them from the body without there being free radical generators. Now let's get into the details. What about ascorbate and divalent cations? The ascorbate with the vicinal hydroxyls. It picks up lead, then mercury, then arsenic, then cadmium, nickel, beryllium, calcium, copper, manganese, and zinc. Uh, this is based on physical chemistry studies. Uh, the references uh, for what I say will generally be on the bottom of the slide, and I trust that in your handouts you have this. Uh, Kim and Rich Fisher deserve a terrific appreciation and maybe even applause uh, for putting together both a good syllabus and the program. Um, but let's get into some of the details. Uh, we want to use ascorbate to safely uh, detoxify toxic metals if they're present. But how much ascorbate do we need, and what will the result be? If you take the math, and I'm going to go through this uh, briefly, but to hopefully clarify, 
If you take a scorbate at one gram, one gram, given that the molecular weight is about 200 uh, Daltons, you have five millimoles per gram of ascorbate. A gram is a thousand milligrams or a million micrograms, and it can bind about 0.01 percent. That is, a 0.01 percent of the ascorbate, after it goes through all of its myriad reactions, will relate to toxic metal complexing and excretion. And if you do the math, that means that a, that a thousand micrograms of ascorbate can bind 0.1 micromoles of lead. And if it's possible to turn down the air conditioning, I could hear myself and maybe you can hear me a little better. Um, it'll also be better for the recording. Uh, so we want to bind uh, lead. We can bind 0.1 micromole of lead. That is 207.2 micrograms based on its weight times 0.1 micromole or 20.7 micrograms of lead when you have enough ascorbate to do all the other jobs that ascorbate has and some more for the toxic metals. If we do the same kind of math, but with regard to mercury, different molecular weight, 20 micrograms, they're not going to be exactly the same number, but they'll be very similar across the toxic metals. So if we go back, we can see 20.7 for lead, we can see 20 for, oh, sorry, yeah, 20.7 for lead, and the next one, I think, has a typo. Yeah. Oh, I should point this in the right direction. Yes. <laughs> here we're, yeah here, I, yeah, here I rounded it off. If you look at all the toxic metals, you get 20.7 micrograms of lead, 20 of mercury, 7.5 of arsenic, 11.2 of cadmium, 5.9 of nickel per gram of ascorbate. Now if you had all of these present, you would need five grams of ascorbate to get that amount out of the range of them. Um, but when we have sufficient ascorbate based on calibration, we can use it to predict how much toxic metal we will safely complex, mobilize, and remove from the body. About 60 percent of that removal for most people is in the urine, 30 percent in the stool, 10 percent in the sweat. But people who are dehydrated will put more in the stool. It is important to have the prebiotic fibers to bind the toxins in the uh, GI tract uh, and to prevent enterohepatic uh, recirculation and reuptake. So the takeaway that I recommend for simple thinking in clinical practice and to have a little extra margin of safety is that about 10 micrograms of toxic metal, about 10 micrograms of toxic mineral, can be mobilized per gram of ascorbate when you're taking in the amount of ascorbate a person needs. And we'll get to how you find that out. It's based on calibration. So if we wanted to mobilize 10 micrograms of toxic mineral in a gram of ascorbate, and we recognize that most Americans get about 20 micrograms per day of toxic mineral exposure, then our suggestion is a baseline of at least two grams a day to protect from the daily turnover. And if you have a body burden that's higher, then you would need more ascorbate because of the pro-oxidant free radical generating effects of any of the oxidative stress molecules. So in terms of daily toxic mineral exposure, about two grams a day can safely protect and excrete from the daily turnover. If you have more in the body or more exposure in the environment, then you would need more ascorbate. So the baseline from our point of view is about two grams a day just to keep even with the toxic metal exchange and more if you want to mobilize uh, the prior burden that's been bioaccumulated. This is all based on half-life. It is not important how much of a nutrient you give. It is important what the concentration or level of that is in the cells. And because ascorbate in healthy people has a half-life of about 30 days, and in unhealthy people has a half-life of about 30 minutes, it has the widest variance of half-life of any molecule in biology because it is also essential for more reactions than any other molecule in biology. So while half-life is always important, it is particularly important with ascorbate and we achieve the same concentration 
when we give more ascorbate to achieve, say, the predictive uh, dose because of that short half-life. So you may need 10 grams or 50 grams or 100 grams of ascorbate to achieve the same concentration in the cell. In one case, your half-life might be uh, 15 days. In another case, your half-life might be an hour or two. And then in the, in the extreme cases, even more variance. So the consumption rate, which is related to this half-life, gives us a good enough for clinical or government work approximation of the daily need to achieve the same cell plasma level. And I do point out that if someone is taking a large amount of ascorbate because they have a lot of oxidative stress and toxic minerals in their body, it is completely appropriate for them to take the amount they need based on calibration or your clinical experience because what you want is the concentration in the cell and if you're using up half in 30 minutes and another half in another 30 minutes, you will have used 75% of what you had an hour ago in an hour. But if you have a 30-day half-life, you can go for a day or two and you'll barely notice the difference. So really healthy people may only need a few grams of ascorbate a day. And finding really healthy people was so hard that when Hugh Reardon, of blessed memory, did it in Wichita, Kansas many years ago, in a year of advertising, they were not able to find more than 25 people in Wichita, Kansas, who were A, healthy, that is asymptomatic by Cornell Medical Index, and B, would talk to them. Now, there may have been other healthy people in Wichita who just didn't respond. But in terms of those who were willing to respond, finding healthy people is roughly uh, as common as finding hen's teeth. Now, I'm going to show a few slides in regard to this ascorbate to show you how different the different needs are. Some people need very little. Less than four grams is the amount to flush for about 5% of the population. About one in 20 people will have their first calibration on less than four grams a day. That's shown in this uh, pinkish arrow, and it's this column, the far left column. We're going to look now at, uh, at uh, the reinforcement of this. We had 3,497 people, 185 of whom, or about 5%, calibrated on less than four grams of ascorbate in the day. What about the rest of the people? The usual population calibrates on five to 10 grams, and that's about another 10% of the people. This is the typical or the ambulatory walking wounded population. In this case, same cohort, 10%, 348 people needed five to 10 grams to flush. That's shown with this arrow, and it's this bar, if you will, on the chart. 80% of the people are the ones with some free radical oxidative damage, and they calibrate between 10 and 130 grams. And if you're used to thinking in milligrams, 130 grams is 130,000 milligrams. And most people will say, 130,000 what? And you explain to them that your body is using this up really fast, or maybe, if you're in this situation, and you need the amount you need to achieve the same healthy cell concentration or cell level, and that's why it's important to determine individually how much ascorbate is needed. And this turquoise uh, uh, splayed uh, data uh, is the average under the curve for the cohort of 2,798 people uh, that calibrated between 10 and 30 grams, uh, the truly walking wounded. So it covers a wide range, the 10 to 130 gram group. It's about 80% of the population. But notice this common population can need over 100 grams of ascorbate on occasion. And then we get to a very interesting group of outliers here. This is about 5% of the population that needs over 130 grams to calibrate. Now, if the first time you try to calibrate, you take a few grams every 15 minutes, it will take you about two months to calibrate. So we have ways of increasing the amount of ascorbate that people take every 15 minutes based on either your clinical impression about how fast they might be using up the ascorbate or based on their following the protocol that I'm going to describe uh, to determine for themselves to bring back to you that information. So we have this interesting group, about 1 in 20 people that need over 130 grams uh, to calibrate. I can tell you that when we first started this work, this was an extremely rare phenomenon. Uh, that was over 20 years ago. In the last 20 years, 
the uh, consumption rate for ascorbate has gone up, the half-life has gone down on average, and we see more and more people uh, in what uh, we think of as uh, a multiple chronic disease state, um, and we'll see whether the future uh, changes this or not, but uh, this is, as I said, based on uh, a cohort of just less than 4,000 people. So if we look at all these groups, we see in the yellow this tiny group of healthy people, and it's actually so slim that I'm having trouble seeing it. Maybe I was out too late last night. The dark blue uh, is the second cohort. Uh, the large middle group, the 80% that calibrate uh, above 10 and below 130 grams, and then the group in red, those that have more than 130 grams to induce uh, calibration. This group, this middle 80%, is particularly active in regard to free radical reactions or oxidative stress reactions, um, and they are a group that is particularly responsive. When they get as much ascorbate and other antioxidants as they need, they respond very well. Until they get the full range of, a of antioxidants that they need, they can be treatment resistant. Um, and perhaps because of our interest in treatment resistant syndromes, uh, we've had an opportunity to see a number of these people. So ascorbate has synergists. We want to talk about not only the ascorbate and its direct ability to mobilize toxic metals, but what is its ability to work with and mobilize toxic metals along with other uh, elements. Ascorbate is synergistic with magnesium and zinc. These are buffering minerals that reduce net acid excess and enhance uh, the competency and resilience to toxic metals. Low magnesium, for example, increases the toxicity of any toxic metals that are present by 10 to 100, by 1 to 2 orders of magnitude, 10 to 100 fold more uh, oxidative stress when the buffering magnesium is low compared to when it is high. Zinc has a similar but less well documented effect. The whole alkaline way or healthier alkaline state we recommend, in fact we recommend checking and correcting metabolic acidosis before detoxifying people and that dramatically reduces the collateral side effects. Sulfur sources and selenomethionine are also helpful, and we're going to look at those uh, over the next uh, few minutes. So, what about working with ascorbate to get a synergy of benefits, a virtuous cycle, if you will, to displace toxic minerals, magnesium, zinc, and alkaline diets, or to complex and remove the toxic minerals safely, sulfur sources in the food, and selenomethionine. If we want to displace, this is an ionic effect. If you displace the toxic metal, you want to be able to trap it in some way on a sulfur source. Uh, the important message is that if you have a first morning urine that is in the healthy 6.5 to 7.5 range, you can proceed immediately to biological detoxification. If the first morning urine pH is below 6.5, we would recommend correcting that with an alkaline diet and targeted buffering mineral supplementation to bring the first morning urine pH into the healthy 6.5 to 7.5 range uh, before removing amalgams or detoxifying the person. There's a good deal more information about the alkaline way on our website, uh, perk.org. This is the information site. Uh, and, uh, I would welcome your uh, coming to that to download uh, the full protocols. In essence, and in headline, if we talk about each of us as individuals, we would measure the first morning urine pH. This means after six hours of rest, it is okay to get up and pee in the middle of that time. It doesn't affect the result. Don't dance, don't go out and read, don't go out and exercise, just go back to bed. Uh, six hours or more of rest are needed in order to equilibrate the urine in the bladder with the cellular pH. So the cells want to get rid of extra metabolic acids. They will do that very actively when you're in a resting mode. So the first morning urine, or the first urine after six hours of rest, I've occasionally had the question, if I'm a night worker and I sleep during the day, does this work? It does. It's the rest period that's essential to equilibrate the urine. During the rest of the day, there are so many other variables that influence the urinary pH that it is not a meaningful predictor of metabolic acidosis. But the first morning urine pH is. This was shown by Sue Whiting 
and her colleagues up in Canada. Uh, we recommend that people keep a daily health log, a kind of daily record or diary, where they can record the first morning urine pH and a note or two about how they're feeling. And they will often come in and say to you, the mornings when I'm alkaline, I'm more optimistic, I'm more resilient, I'm less symptomatic. The mornings when I'm more acidic, I'm more pessimistic, I'm more helpless, I'm more symptomatic. So there is a physiological range, but it's very small and, and narrow. We recommend the high contrast hydrion paper with a range of five and a half to uh, eight. Yeah, that does say eight. Five and a half to eight. Um, and you take about two inches of that each morning. Uh, so a typical roll will have about 100 different tests. Um, and that makes it a very cost efficient way uh, of predicting metabolic acidosis and getting a therapeutic monitor uh, to help improve outcomes. This is a, a, a clinical overview that we put together. We'd be happy to send it to you or have you download from the website, pointing out this is the healthy repair zone. This is where wound healing occurs very actively. If you're in metabolic acidosis, that quenches wound healing, reduces immune competence, enhances oxidative stress. And on the other hand, if you're high consistently, that can be catabolic illness associated with surgery and other kinds of chronic stresses. This is a situation in which the body is cannibalizing itself, tearing down protein, and losing ammonia in the urine. That accounts for the high uh, excessive pH. Uh, if you have a net acid excess, then the first morning urine will be below 6.5. So we know what the physiological and healthy range is. Uh, we know where we get the most clinical benefit response. And that turns out to correlate with uh, the healthy zone in terms of acid base uh, measurements. So in terms of physiologic pH, uh, the range is really narrow compared to the chemistry. Uh, the venous pH, for example, is kept between 7.32 and 7.42 uh, whenever possible. The arterial pH is slightly more alkaline than that. Um, you can do venous, or even arterial, but you can do venous blood gas measurements uh, to measure the anion gap and confirm that the first morning urine pH correlates with, if you will, the gold standard, which is venous pH uh, for acid alkaline status. The more acidic you are, the more sick you are, and the more treatment resistant you're likely to be. The more alkaline you are up to a certain point, the healthier you are. But if you're in a catabolic state where you're losing ammonia because you're cannibalizing amino acids for energy, that's uh, the other side of a problem. The middle ground, the middle path, is where we want to be. So let's go back and say, beyond buffering and getting minerals out with magnesium and zinc, what can we do to conjugate the toxic metals? What can we do to bind the toxic metals to biological sulfur so that the body is able to safely and effectively excrete it by a different mechanism? The high sulfur foods are garlic, onions, ginger, eggs, and brassica sprouts. Brassica sprouts mean broccoli sprouts. Um, these foods, one or more, as a staple of the diet. So for example, when we recommend ginger to people, we recommend that they use ginger tea as a beverage of choice so that they will take probably 30 to 50 grams of fresh ginger over a day. When we talk about garlic, we're not talking about one little garlic uh, uh, element. We're talking about bulbs of garlic, whole garlic that you might roast and have as a vegetable at the meal. That's the kind of intake of high sulfur foods that are associated with long-lived populations. They're associated with low risk of disease and high degree of functionality uh, above the age of 80. So one of the things that we did uh, that was to us, interesting and, and confirmatory is after we had the biochemistry to show that toxic metals would bind to the sulfur foods, we had anthropologist colleagues look across the world at the healthy populations, and they all have several things in common. Minerals rich in the diet, but from different sources. Sulfur sources rich in the diet, but from different sources. If you're in Thailand, you're going to get a different source of sulfur-rich food than if you're in Denver or in Japan. But across, as far as we can tell, the entire world experience, 
the alkaline way is common to the healthiest population in each culture uh, as they define themselves. And then selenomethionine, what we believe to be the only biologically safe and effective form of selenium, selenomethionine is able to complex directly with toxic metals as if there was sulfur rather than selenium in that methionine. And this can be helpful beyond activating vitamin Z as it does in the membrane. Selenomethionine can be helpful in complexing with toxic metals. And be aware that if you complex selenomethionine with a toxic metal, you need to replace that selenomethionine in order for the vitamin E to work in the membrane. So you can have all the tocopherol vitamin E you need and want, and the vitamin E won't work until it's complexed with selenomethionine. The uh, conjugation with selenomethionine uh, has been reported uh, in the uh, Seychelles Medical and Dental Journal in 2004. <clears throat> I think this is probably the best article on the subject. It's by the USDA Grand Forks group, uh, Laura Raymond and uh, Nick Ralston. Um, and they specifically looked at mercury, selenium interactions, and health implications. Um, and uh, when you get to the journal, what you'll find is that selenomethionine was singularly helpful. They did not test selenocysteine, for any of you who uh, are interested in that. It wasn't, I think, available to them at the time. So we use these sulfur sources. They get depleted, but the sulfur sources are sources for glutathione manufacture. So if we use up the sulfur sources with toxic metals, we won't have those same sulfur sources to build glutathione. And you may be aware that depletion of glutathione is one of the more common phenomena in oxidative stress illness and particularly toxic metal related oxidative stress. So we want to have enough sulfur sources in the diet to uh, manage not just the detoxification but also provide the basis for glutathione and other sulfur uh, synthesis in the body. Selenomethionine depletion impairs vitamins E and its membrane protection, and you get more oxidative stress. The takeaway here is you could have nine out of 10 of the things you need, but be missing one, and the whole system doesn't work well. So life is a question of balance. It is a matter of having all of what we need. And I've had colleagues who say, I couldn't take B12 today, so I took two B6. Will that work? <laughs> now let's talk for a moment about innate protection. Healthy people make metallothionine, which is a biological sponge that soaks up toxic metals and prevents their adverse effects. In contrast, people under stress People who have oxidative damage or deficiency of antioxidants, people who are acidotic and therefore lack buffering minerals like magnesium and zinc, they will show magnified adverse effects of the toxic metals. So at a research level, metallothionines are the protective endogenous, the intrinsic protective uh, toxic metal sink. The toxic metals get soaked up by the metallothionine and the body doesn't get an adverse effect. But the metallothionine depends upon adequate magnesium and zinc. That means being alkaline. It depends upon sulfur amino acids like cysteine because it's really glycine cysteine polypeptides. That's what metallothionine is. And in healthy people we find abundant metallothionines in the spinal fluid, in the blood, in the urine, they're different, but they're throughout the body. In contrast, when a person is in metabolic acidosis because of a lack of buffering minerals, when a person shows oxidative stress, TNF alpha goes up, interleukins go up showing oxidative stress responses, that is a sure sign of antioxidant deficiency. You cannot have excess free radical oxidative damage without a lack of antioxidants. When you have enough antioxidants, you don't get free radical oxidative damage. So, metallothionines are abundantly present in healthier people. They're absent because under stress, the cell shifts into a survival mode. And in survival mode, 
the cell is only able to do what it must for survival. It downregulates all elective protective molecules. So it downregulates metallothionines. That makes the individual susceptible to accelerated or amplified toxic metal adversity. Similarly with selenomethionine. If we use the selenomethionine to complex with toxic metals and we leave vitamin E uncomplexed, vitamin E is absent of the selenomethionine, then you'll have more oxidative damage uh, and less membrane protection. So only when metallothionines and alkaline mineral reserves are depleted first do you get toxic mineral uptake. Only with magnesium deficit and metabolic acidosis do you have an increase in free radical oxidative effects a hundred to a thousand fold over what you would have if you had magnesium adequately to buffer. This is in Journal of Biological Chemistry eight years ago, nine years ago now, um, and quite an important article, I think, because it very clearly shows that the buffering minerals like magnesium decrease by two orders of magnitude the toxicity of toxic metals like mercury. And so, for sure, I would like to keep magnesium high. I would like to keep sulfur sources sufficient so that the body's own sponge or sink to soak up the toxic metals is enabled, not disabled. In that JBC article, they pointed out that a relative calcium excess, which is another way of saying relative magnesium deficiency, if you have relatively too much calcium and too little magnesium, then retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic neuropathy and renal disease, myofascial pain and myolysis, probably fibromyalgia, probably chronic fatigue syndrome, probably progressive autoimmune diseases in general, free radical vascular diseases, and repair deficits known as inflammation, arteriosclerotic heart disease and coronary artery disease are all magnified and amplified. So the backdrop that we can most easily deal with to reduce all of these risks is to be alkaline and to know that by the first morning urine pH being in the healthy six and a half to seven and a half range. Now let's compare ascorbate to glutathione. Ascorbate has a reducing potential that is independent of concentration. The brackets here are the chemist symbol for concentration. By comparison, glutathione, while it is a reducing substance, it's concentration dependent. So when glutathione reduces in concentration, it is a less effective antioxidant. When ascorbate reduces in concentration, it is just as effective as an antioxidant. So ascorbate is independent of concentration with regard to reducing potential. That's a contrast to glutathione. Ascorbate, in the stressed cell, there's an increased uptake of dehydroascorbate. This is dehydroascorbate, not to be confused with a certain fatty acid that will go nameless. The increased uptake in dehydroascorbate is facilitated by diffusion from inner and outer sources. This is in contrast to glutathione, where oxidative stress the cell exports the disulfide of glutathione, and by exporting that disulfide, it reduces the sulfur pool and reduces the antioxidant capacity. The third point is that ascorbate and DHA are imported into the cell. DHA is rapidly re-reduced to ascorbate. Glutathione is not imported into cells. It is generally made de novo. It's synthesized inside the cell. Uh, and that uh, regeneration versus intracellular recycling uh, is, uh, is the issue. Again, let's compare. Red cells store ascorbate 30 times over plasma. So if your plasma is one milligram per deciliter, your adrenal level is 30, and all of your metabolically active cells take up the ascorbate and concentrate it 30-fold over plasma, which means a difference between 1 and 2 in the plasma level is a difference between 30 and 60 at the cellular level. That also says that cells really like ascorbate. They can take up the ascorbate 30-fold over plasma without using a lot of energy to do that. 
It's a good trick. A score bait increases by oral intake, individualized calibration. It's hard to increase glutathione orally. There is potential for gut dysbiosis when you give oxidized forms of glutathione or impure forms of glutathione. Dehydroascorbate can generate glucose uh, and increase NADPH for glutathione production and anabolic pathways. In contrast, recycling glutathione complex is a multi-step. It consumes ATP uh, and therefore reduces the cell energy potential. Ascorbate is regenerated in mitochondria by three pathways. Glutathione is only regenerated in the cytosol and transported into the mitochondria. Exogenous ascorbate intake is facilitated by diffusion. Two molecules of ATP are needed for each molecule of glutathione formed, and two ATPs are needed for its degradation. So glutathione turnover, as important as it is for the cell, uses up ATP. Ascorbate turnover preserves or enhances both ATP availability and glutathione concentration. So glutathione and ascorbate mutually spare each other in reactions with the intracellular oxi uh, reactive oxygen species. The linked biochemistry uh, is such that regeneration of glutathione or ascorbate is efficient, reciprocal, and predicts an increase in ascorbate concentration that in turn spares glutathione and reciprocally vice versa. Cells often have bidirectional pathways uh, in order to protect themselves. This is just the same information reinforced to show that ascorbate in the presence of a reduced oxygen species or a free radical goes to dehydroascorbate. Uh, glutarodoxone regenerates the ascorbate uh, and in the process of that uh, the glutathione disulfide is re-reduced uh, to glutathione. Mitochondrial uptake is important especially for ascorbate recycling. The ascorbate is present in the intermembrane space and in the cytochrome matrix. So the ascorbate goes all the way into the battery of the cell uh, and protects it. We recycle dehydroascorbate and ascorbate free radical by several pathways. Uh, the recycling of ascorbate is more sensitive to oxidant stress than glutathione thiols and tocopherols. Ascorbate is, in a sense, a maternal or sacrificial molecule. Ascorbate in mitochondria is often in the millimolar range. In fact, ascorbate is often the most prevalent molecule in metabolically active cells, and it continues to concentrate 30-fold over plasma all the way up to the physical saturation of ascorbate, which is about 5 millimolar. That in itself is remarkable uh, evidence of its safety. Ascorbate is oxidized by a reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, by superoxide, by peroxide, before glutathione, thiols, and vitamin Z. So ascorbate sacrifices itself to protect the other uh, antioxidants. Superoxide can react with nitric oxide uh, to form the more dangerous peroxynitrite. Uh, ascorbate can most effectively reduce or detoxify this. So we need NO, we need nitric oxide. Uh, we want superoxide to be present where we need it, but we don't want it to get away and damage things. Ascorbate is the most effective way that we know biologically uh, to prevent from the peroxynitrite formation uh, that can be uh, damaging. Now, this is a 45-month-old girl with 5-oxoprolinuria, uh, so the pyroglutamic aciduria uh, syndrome. She had uh, fragile red cells and hemolysis, marked glutathione depletion caused by deficiency of glutathione synthetase. She was followed before and after treatment with ascorbate or an acetylcysteine. The high-dose ascorbate, now high-dose ascorbate to them was 0.7 millimoles per kilogram per day. If you translate that, say, for a 100 kilogram person, it would be 70 millimoles. Yeah, would be 70 millimoles, uh, and that would be a full dose of ascorbate. Or NAC, 6 millimoles per kilogram per day, again, a high dose. Given for one to two weeks without any obvious deleterious effects, ascorbate increase the lymphocyte and plasma levels of glutathione fourfold for the lymphocyte, eightfold for the plasma. The comparison was NAC did increase lymphocyte glutathione, but less, and the plasma, but less. So both are beneficial, ascorbate more beneficial. It also turns out to be less expensive. Now, with regard to glutathione and ascorbate levels and their correlations, 
Intracellular antioxidants like glutathione and ascorbate have markers of DNA damage, like 8-oxoguanine, which you can measure in clinical laboratories. Um, and that was measured in this case in 105 volunteers. Uh, the endpoints revealed that naturally occurring levels of intracellular antioxidants are inversely or negatively correlated with the level of oxidative DNA damage. The results strongly suggest that intracellular glutathione and ascorbate protect human lymphocytes against oxidative DNA damage. I show this principally because there's one other report that says the opposite. I think this is uh, very well controlled. Uh, if we look at the same subject and extend it, the plasma ascorbate is linearly associated with lymphocytes. Uh, we show the regression value and the p-value. Ascorbate lymphocyte values, uh, ascorbate went up 51% on average uh, in this population. Changes in lymphocyte ascorbate after supplementation were, chain, were associated with changes in lymphocyte glutathione with a high degree of statistical significance. And it suggests for every one mole change in ascorbate, there's a half mole change in glutathione. So when you raise ascorbate, you raise glutathione as a collateral benefit. Ascorbate supplements the increase in glutathione in human lymphocytes, and I'm going to go on to suggest that ascorbate is the most effective and safest way to raise glutathione. This is a tribute to Olson Meister, uh, who was chairman of uh, biochemistry at Columbia for many years, and he's the one that showed that ascorbate increase causes glutathione increase. Anything else is less effective, even giving glutathione in the reduced form. His conclusion, many studies, is that ascorbate increase increases glutathione in human plasma and lymphocytes better than all others. So the best way to raise glutathione is to have adequate ascorbate. What about the clinical applications? The individual need um, is the calibration method. If you do it following the bowel tolerance approach of creeping up to the amount of ascorbate you need to loosen stool, you will get, in many cases, significant abdominal discomfort, bloating, gas, things that patients generally don't like. We instruct the patient to stop if they're too uncomfortable, but to see our ascorbate calibration handout because some people who are acidic need magnesium in order to get easy benefit from the ascorbate calibration. Some people with dysbiosis need healthy uh, probiotic organisms to get the most easy benefit from the ascorbate calibration. Uh, patients who uh, have uh, a lot of uh, toxin to detoxify need prebiotic fibers, or they may need recycled glutamine to energize the gut in order to get the most easy and effective uh, benefit from the ascorbate calibration. So there are some details that do matter. If you use the ascorbate calibration, you can calculate the total dosage to flush, you can multiply by 3 quarters or 75 percent, and get the daily needed dose. You can give that four times a day if it's relatively small, or if it's a larger amount, we'd recommend making up a jogger's bottle and sipping on it throughout the day. Again, details of this are on the website. Um, I'm trying to balance between those of you who have heard this often before, for whom it's reinforcement, and some of you for whom this may be relatively new. The option of starting with gradually increasing four times a day dosing if the patient is hesitant, has irritable bowel syndrome, or lacks trust is fine. We, however, have had a number of patients, some of them being uh, memorable, in that sense dramatic, uh, patients that were weeks away from surgery with ulcerative colitis, who were able to do the ascorbate calibration when guided safely and effectively, and many of them able to avoid surgery. The mechanism is a bit complex, but we can go into the details uh, as desired. It is not seen in IV therapy, and it is not an osmotic effect. So if a person needs, say, 50 grams of ascorbate to calibrate orally, and for whatever reason you infuse 50 grams into their vein, they won't flush. And that's because the enterohepatic circulation is different than the systemic circulation, and we can talk about the details of that if you want, but they are different. It is not an osmotic effect. So if you give the ascorbate as hypotonic, isosmotic, or hypertonic uh, concentrations, you will get exactly the same amount to flush. And when you think about it more deeply, what you pour in at the top does not have enough time to get to the bottom, which is the transit time, in the time it takes to flush. 
So the ascorbate comes in through the mouth, is absorbed through the stomach, and the upper GI tract flows systemically to saturate all ascorbate needs throughout the body, and then when the cells have as much ascorbate as they need, the ascorbate is pumped into the rectum along with toxins and extra fluid because of the ATP activation of those cells, and it's the flush of the fluids and toxins that have been pumped into the rectum actively uh, that induces the actual flush. Uh, Jaffe, whoever that is, postulates that active, safer excretion of toxins is possible on the basis of this kind of presentation. Um, I used to talk about myself entirely in the third person, but I got tired of that. No danger of rebound. It is best, best however, to taper, uh, ramp up and taper down with this and most nutrients. And the details are in the ascorbate calibration protocol for those who would like them. So if we calibrate our ascorbate and meet the individual needs, it sets cell redox potential or electrical vitality. It protects and recycles. It traps free radicals. It mothers ATP. And if you learn enough about ATP, we'll start talking about AQP. Because not only is there a triphosphate, there's a quatrophosphate in really healthy people. And there's also PEP, phosphoenopyruvate. One of the things I've learned as a biochemist is that once people catch on with what you're talking about, you can always talk about something even more detailed. Tocopherols protect the membrane when they have selenomethionine. Glutathione protects the cytosol. It's best raised by adequate ascorbate. Taurine protects the transport system, but taurine itself is recycled and regenerated by ascorbate, as is lipoic acid, which helps protect the nucleus and do other good things. Let's look at the details of this ascorbate calibration flush. In healthy people, we recommend a half a teaspoon, which is one and a half grams, half a teaspoon, and generally in two to eight doses, healthy people, more than 90% of them, will calibrate. What about people who are feeling poorly? Here we would start with one teaspoon or three grams, two to 10 doses, 90% of those people will calibrate. Remember, however, some of these people need much higher amounts to calibrate, and therefore you'll need to come back with even more, either a longer time or uh, a higher concentration. Chronically ill people, we would recommend starting at two grams, sorry, two teaspoons, which is six grams. So chronically ill people have a very short half-life. They need a lot of ascorbate. And it's OK to start with two teaspoons or six grams every 15 minutes. They're generally two to 10 doses. 75% of that population uh, will uh, calibrate. In all cells that are metabolically active, ascorbate is concentrated 30 times over the plasma concentration. I said that before, but it's worth reinforcing that a little bit of change in the plasma ascorbate level translates into a big change at the tissue level. Prooxidants induce free radicals that damage cell structures and age the cells antioxidants protect. Which is ascorbate and under what conditions? Well, ascorbate is an antioxidant. This is the reduced ascorbate. It's a free radical trap. If it was a prooxidant, it would be in the free radical form and it would be a free radical source. The conclusion, and you can thank Rich Fisher for my taking about 15 slides out of these two. I don't think you missed anything, but I do have them at the end of the talk, and they're in the syllabus for anyone who's interested. But the conclusion is that high serum or plasma levels of ascorbate are independently associated with a decreased prevalence of elevated blood levels. If these associations are related causally, we can never be sure of much in science, if these associations are related causally, ascorbic acid intake may have public health implications for control of lead toxicity. Uh, this was about a decade ago in JAMA, uh, and I think a particularly good article uh, to point to colleagues who say, is there any science that supports this? Ascorbate levels in uh, smokers uh, were associated and linked through the blood lead levels. Uh, this was reported in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition about 10 years ago. Daily supplementation with 1,000 milligrams of ascorbic acid or a gram of ascorbic acid results in a significant decrease in blood lead levels associated with the general population. Ascorbic acid supplementation may provide an economical and convenient method of reducing blood lead levels, possibly by reducing the intestinal absorption of lead. So if you complex the toxic metal in the gut with the ascorbate, that won't be taken up. If you complex the ascorbate with the toxic metal inside the body, it will be excreted through any of the water-soluble mechanisms uh, and safely removed from the body. 
So extensive exercise might promote the formation of reactive oxygen species and contribute to tissue damage. Thus, free radical levels in plasma were assessed, were measured by electron paramagnetic resonance, EPR, to check pro-oxidant action. The results are that vitamin C radical level, so the AFR, the ascorbate free radical, remains stable during the whole period. Neither vitamin E supplementation nor exercise had any influence on the plasma concentration of vitamin C radical. The conclusion, vitamin E supplementation under conditions of mild oxidative stress does not result in increased vitamin C radical concentration. There's no pro-oxidant action. And this was from the European Journal of Nutrition in 2003. Balls, uh, Bruce Ames and Balls Fry have reviewed the world literature on ascorbate, and they reported to be the safer and most versatile water-soluble antioxidant. This means that adequate ascorbate can protect, directly and indirectly, every part of the cell and organ system from free radical damage. It can't, however, protect from ignorance. Now, what does the literature say about ascorbate as an antioxidant or a pro-oxidant? Well, it says that an essential element of health-promoting lifestyle is eating nutritious, healthy foods, yet food can be a source of exposure to toxins, and current food production methods can have a negative effect on environment and consumers. We're identifying contaminants present in food and describe the adverse health effects with recommendations of how exposure can be prevented or minimized. Um, let me go back, because the reference was actually on the top, and this is an article that we published in Seminars of Integrative Medicine in 2006. Uh, and it, too, would be on the website, or we'd be happy to send you uh, reprints of it, electronic reprints, if you're interested. Now, if we individualize ascorbate uptake or ascorbate availability, we want to know how much is needed now, because it varies over time. We can use ascorbate well and in a, on an individualized basis, teaching people the tool and then letting them use the tool for themselves at home. We can even do this for ourselves. And it's much more effective when the, the client knows that we're actually doing this ourselves or our loved ones are as well. Ascorbate sends Georgie, uh, who isolated ascorbate from Hungarian paprika, considered it a life-giving molecule. This is his 1932 uh, article, uh, the first page in a reprint. Uh, he is the one who showed, and others have confirmed, that ascorbate concentrates 30-fold over plasma, that it's the most prevalent complex molecule in metabolically active cells and that adequate amounts replaced most, little more than half, of sugar cravings. So if you know anyone that has hypoglycemia symptoms, ask them to calibrate their ascorbate, and a little more than half the time, the hypoglycemia will go away, because the body is hungry for ascorbate that other species can make out of glucose, and the uh, clinical uh, manifestation is the hypoglycemic symptoms, not because blood sugar is low, but because ascorbate is low. And when you give the ascorbate as needed, the hypoglycemic symptoms go away. What about acute musculoskeletal pain? Here we want to mobilize the dendritic cells. The dendritic cells are your first responder cells. They're the cells responsible for primary defense and repair. And here we recommend two flavonoid flavanol capsules every 15 minutes until you're comfortable for one hour. Then two per hour while awake for two days four twice daily maintenance for three months to consolidate the improvement. This rapid use of safe polyphenols, safe flavonoids and flavanols, has, for example, taken patients who were uh, in asthmatic status. In one case, a woman had called the EMTs to take her to the hospital. Then she called her doctor who suggested this. By the time the EMTs came, she had taken two doses and was better enough that they watched her for 45 minutes while she took another three doses, and then she was fine and sent the EMTs home. Another case, I got called two or three weeks ago on Thursday because a woman was sitting on the edge of her bed trying to decide if she should go to the hospital because of her asthma, and would I talk to her? This is someone I had never spoken to before. I said, no, I think she should go to the hospital, and when they take care of her, then I'd be happy to talk to her. I'm a prevention doctor, not a treatment doctor. She says, would you please talk to her? She won't go anywhere. In five minutes, the woman convinced me that she knew what was going on. And at the end, she said, and no doctor ever listens to me. But if any doctor ever did, I would be just fine. I said, may I paraphrase back what you just said? She says, yes. And I just 
repeated back what she had said, and she said, you're listening to me. I can trust you. That night, having followed this approach, she went out dancing. And because she is the first lady of Samoa, married to the governor of Samoa, I got a whole commendation from the first lady, or from the governor of Samoa. So sometimes you get unexpected benefits. Sometimes you get unexpected uh, hassles, but sometimes you get unexpected benefits. So if we want to activate these dendritic first-line repair cells, we might take four of these flavonoid flavanol uh, tabsules with each meal and before bed until we're comfortable for a week, and then four twice a day for maintenance. This is for chronic musculoskeletal pain, whereas the other recommendation was for acute musculoskeletal pain. So in the acute situation, we want to get a lot of these polyphenols in to activate and keep those dendritic cells moving. When my son was in either middle school or beginning high school, middle school, uh, he was playing baseball, and it was widely known that when my son got injured, he took this flavonoid flavanol combination and ascorbate. A friend of his, a teammate friend of his, was hit by a bat. This happens a lot at that age. Sometimes they hit themselves, sometimes someone else hits them. But the child was hit by a bat, goes off to the side to kind of regroup, and the swelling came up in his eye so fast that you could see the eye close because of the swelling. The child asked me if he could have some of what Sky takes. Now, I'm not this child's father, so it's probably unwise for me to treat the child on the spot. Fortunately, the parent of the child was there. The child did take this item and got back into the game in the next inning because the swelling came down that fast. When you see those cases happen, you're totally convinced that activating the dendritic cells, the first line repair cells, is a really good thing to do, and that all too often they just are depleted in their energetics. They're intoxicated because of toxic metals. They are acidotic and lacking in antioxidants, and they just don't work right, leading to the inflammation, which is really repair deficit that we see. So for chronic musculoskeletal pain, we have a different schedule. We want to keep oxidized cholesterol and oxidized LDL at zero. We want to prevent them from forming. Tocopherols and tocotrienols, 400 to 3600 IU of all different forms, all eight forms, and selenomethionine, 0.2 to 1 milligram a day, uh, are effective at this approach. Uh, this was pioneered by the Shute brothers up in Canada uh, and confirmed by others. Um, after a number of years of doing cardiovascular work, I would say if you keep the oxidized cholesterol and oxidized LDL to zero, and you have healthy methylation, and you have healthy alkaline state, that you have a zero risk of cardiovascular disease, whether you're a human, a Yucatan pig, or a foxhound dog. If you want to know about your cat, I can't tell you. But I can tell you a lot about Yucatan pigs and foxhound dogs and how that relates to people. And the takeaway message is keep the oxidation from happening, keep the antioxidant status high, and you reduce one major piece of cardiovascular risk. The second piece has to do with healthy methylation, keep the homocysteine less than six. And the third piece has to do with pH, making sure that the metabolic acidosis or catabolic illness have been corrected. What about ascorbate safety? Does ascorbate cause oxalate kidney stone formation? No, 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 and no. And if you want to know my answer, it's still no. Is B12 consumed by ascorbate? No, 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 and no. Is a Fenton reaction happening in people? No, 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 and no. It happens in the test tube. There is a Fenton reaction in which iron and ascorbate interact through a free radical mechanism in a test tube. And it's called the Fenton reaction because Professor Fenton described it. His name was Schwartz. It would be called the Schwartz reaction. This does not happen in the body. It only happens in the test tube. It's been tested at femtosecond speed. It, Fenton reactions don't happen in the body. The reason I know this is because the gold standard for treatment of hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis, according to the FDA monograph, is ascorbate, including parenteral ascorbate. If hemosiderosis and hemochromatosis people were subject to Fenton reactions and you gave them ascorbate by vein, you would, let me see, kill them. 
Since they're alive and do better, and the iron is reduced from ferric to ferrous and easily mobilized and excreted, reducing the excess iron in the body safely, we can conclude that because the patient survived, the Fenton reaction didn't occur in the body. Good hydration is always recommended, and that is the principal therapy for stone risk of all kinds, including oxalate. If you want to know right now whether you are well hydrated, take your palm and turn it over, pinch the skin on the back of your palm, and let it go. It should go flat within one one second. If it slowly or takes more than one second to flatten out, have a drink of water. L'chai. B12 consumption in vitro, there may be some reason for concern, not in vivo. The Fenton reaction, yes, in vitro, but not in vivo. Details, details, details. Details that make ascorbate more effective. Well, people need enough to fill their ascorbate needs. That's why we developed the calibration protocol. Fully reduced ascorbate is better. Fully buffered ascorbate is better. Ascorbate without masking agents is better. All L ascorbate, not DL. All L ascorbate is better. The people who say, I tried ascorbate, it causes me uh, on discomfort in the gut, are people who are taking synthetic DL ascorbate. The D ascorbate builds up in the gut and can be irritating. It's never recommended. So we want to restore homeostasis in practice. We want to restore homeostasis for sustained and enhanced well-being. And Albertson's Georgie pointed out that leaving the jungle, we lost our ability to make ascorbate. Modern science and technology made it possible to live in full health outside of the jungle, offering ascorbate for one and a half cents a gram. To take full advantage of this, ascorbate should be a household article, like sugar or flour, and be sold by the pound in the supermarket instead of sold in pills by the druggist. Since Georgie pointed out if you have a sugar bowl on your table, you should have an ascorbate bowl on the table and use equal numbers of teaspoons. Uh, Linus Pauling said, the reason I spend time thinking about medical problems like vitamin C is that I believe we are going to solve problems of finding out how to keep the world from being destroyed in nuclear war. If we do that, then it's worthwhile to be thinking about making the world a better place for coming generations of humans. Pauling also said, improving people's health by reducing suffering caused by hypoascorbemia that's low vitamin C, from which far too many in the world suffer unnecessarily. Only a few enlightened people seem to be taking adequate amounts, levels of vitamin C, and therefore are in the fortunate position of not suffering from a genetic disorder that we have learned to control, that is vitamin C ascorbate functional insufficiency. The take home message is, take care of your mitochondria and they will take care of you, and vice versa. Nourishment is elegantly simple in concept, uh, yet one so often overlooked at great cost. Many current clinical conditions are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction that in turn is caused by oxidative damage that in turn is an antioxidant deficit or uh, caused by an antioxidant deficit. You want to keep mitochondrial energy production foremost in your thoughts, both for you and your patients, and we all benefit. So together, we can find a better way to mitigate, remediate, and prevent epidemics of chronic illness and lack of wellness related to mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, there are a number of other slides that at another time I would be happy to share with you. They are in the syllabus. You're welcome to take a look at them at your leisure. I hope that you found this interesting and it will motivate you to look more deeply at an old friend but a useful friend, ascorbate buffered vitamin C. Uh, if we can be of help, we are grateful for the opportunity to serve. Uh, and while it is getting close to lunch, if there are any very brief questions, I'd be happy to address them.